The naval war is a relatively overlooked part of the Great War, lost in the drama of a worldwide conflict and with few large fleet actions. Yet in many ways the war swung on the battle at sea as both the Entente and Central Powers sought to starve the other through naval blockade. There are many compelling stories of the efforts to defend commerce from the U-boat menace, but the contributions of the United States Coast Guard, which had only been officially created in 1915, is an even more forgotten part of the conflict. And yet the Coasties served and died in the Battle of the Atlantic. On September 26, 1918, the United States suffered its greatest naval combat loss of life of the First World War. The loss of the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Tampa is history that deserves to be remembered. The revenue cutter Miami was one of two authorized in 1910 and built by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. Contrary to appearance, the boat was not named after the city of Miami, Florida, but like many revenue cutters, was named after a Native American peoples, the Algonquin-speaking people indigenous to the Great Lakes called the Miami. 190 feet long, with a beam of 32 and a half feet and a draft of 14 feet, the 1,181-ton displacement vessel was armed with three six-pounder rapid-fire guns. With her 1,260-horsepower vertical triple expansion steam engine, she could make 16 knots. Established as the Revenue Marine in 1790 for the purpose of customs enforcement, the service was renamed the Revenue Cutter Service in 1890. By then, the role of the service had broadened, and the Miami, according to the 2017 book Tampa's Own, published by the Tampa Bay History Center, was part of the Revenue Cutter fleet and worked in South Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, Florida Straits, Key West, and Tampa, collecting customs duties and tonnage taxes and deterring smuggling. The Miami was very active from her launch in 1912. In addition to customs duties, she rescued ships in distress, towed or destroyed derelicts that were hazard to shipping, and in 1915 captured a ship running guns to Mexico. In 1913, Miami was assigned to what would become the International Ice Patrol, established in response to the 1912 sinking of RMS Titanic. Among her many duties, perhaps her most unique at the time was, of course, fighting pirates. At what has been described as the Bay Area's biggest party the Gasparilla Pirate Festival. Inspired by an apocryphal Spanish pirate named Jose Gaspar, supposedly the last of the buccaneers, the Tampa Bay Gasparilla Pirate Festival is a carnival-type celebration that was first held in 1904, featuring an invasion by King Gasparilla. In 1913, the Miami was invited to participate in the festivities, where the Tampa Bay Tribune noted, the pirate ship fired a shot across Miami's bow after which the commander of the Miami consulted with his officers and also with representatives of the city who were on board. In the end, he caused the flag of his ship to be dipped to the Pirate King in admission of the fact that he was to rule over the city of Tampa and the waters adjacent thereto for at least one day. The participation of the Miami in the festival became an annual occurrence and helped to establish the ship's relationship with the people of Tampa. The website of Hillsborough County, Florida writes, The ship and its crew had become fixtures at Gasparilla festivities, firing the cutter's cannons at a mock pirate ship during the latter vessel's annual invasion of the city. The booming exchange initiated the tradition of gun blasts that continues today. The Tampa's appearance also served as a Coast Guard recruiting tool, which largely is why two dozen local men were crew members. Tampa's own notes, Many of the crew members were from Tampa and had joined the service when the ship was in port. They not only took part in the flotilla invasion, but were able to enjoy the parade and the fair. In 1915, Congress combined the Revenue Cutter Service and the U.S. Life Saving Service to form the United States Coast Guard. That year, the Miami made headlines when she survived a thrilling ride in a West Indies hurricane by using a derelict vessel it was towing as a sea anchor. The following year, right before the Pirate Festival, the Miami was officially renamed Tampa in recognition of the boat's close association with the city. Tampa's own reports. The Tampa Rotary Club hosted an elegant banquet for the newly named Tampa's officers and crew at the Tampa Bay Hotel and presented the ship with a silver service. The website of American Legion Post 5 of Tampa, Florida describes the busy season for the crew of the Cutter. 1917 was very eventful to the crew of Tampa. The South Florida Fair and the Gasparilla Carnival of Tampa was the greatest yet, lasting nine days from February 2nd through the 10th. With four days to recuperate from the Gala Affair, they went on to patrol the annual boat regatta at Miami from the 15th through the 17th of February. On March 27th and 28th, they patrolled the races at St. Petersburg Yacht Club in St. Petersburg, Florida. But life was about to change for the Tampa and the nation. The website continues. 
There was a shadow over the spring gaiety of 1917, however. February 2nd, opening day of the fair and carnival in Tampa, was the day the United States broke off diplomatic relations with Germany. Perhaps the men of the Tampa sensed that they would be the last celebration with the citizens of Tampa, Florida. On April 6th, the United States declared war with Germany, and immediately the Tampa and other Coast Guard cutters were transferred to the Navy. The Tampa was refitted with newer, larger, three-inch guns, painted Navy gray, and sent off to war. The historian of the United States Coast Guard notes that the Tampa, under the command of Captain Charles Satterley, was one of six Coast Guard vessels that was assigned to do convoy duty in European waters during World War I. Satterley had become a cadet with the Revenue Cutter Service in 1895, and by 1915 had achieved the rank of captain when he had taken command of the cutter. Satterley was from Connecticut, but he had spent significant time in Tampa with the Revenue Cutter Service and was a familiar sight as the captain of the Tampa. Tampa's own says of him, as he served as captain on the Tampa and was in our port, he would take showers at the hotel, write cars and letters home. Remember, he even received the silver service from the Rotary Club in 1916 at the Tampa Bay Hotel. Captain Satterley was one of our boys, too. He was one of many. Tampa's own continues, three sets of brothers and two cousins from Tampa were part of the Tampa's crew. The Mansfield boys, Frederick, age 17, and Percy, age 20, joined right out of Hillsborough High School. Leonard and William Bozeman were first cousins. The crew also included brothers Algy and Arthur Bevins. Tampa's own notes that Algy worked for Furman Motor Cars, which had been a bicycle shop only 15 years before. The Furman family still owns the business today, a century later. Also on the crew were brothers Wambolt and Homer Sumner, September 2018 edition of the Tampa Bay Times says of the brothers, Wambolt Sumner, the ship's acting writer, hailed from Tampa. He loved to play baseball and always had a smile. He joined the Coast Guard out of guilt after his younger brother, Homer, enlisted. The crew also included three African Americans from the Tampa area, Eston Drew Legree, Herman Carmichael, and William Holland. Tampa's own notes that the three had grown up just a few blocks apart. Notable on the crew were its youngest members. Vincento Guerriero was just 16. According to the Tampa Bay Times, he had signed up under the assumed name Jimmy Ross because he was afraid that his father would object to his enlistment. But the Times continues, Guerrero wasn't the youngest crew member, though. That distinction fell to 15-year-old Irving Slickland of New York City, son of a lawyer. Tall for his age, Slickland decided to enlist one day after school in March 1918. His grandmother was so appalled that she ran to the recruiting office in her bedroom slippers, followed by his father, but they couldn't get him released. His parents finally gave their reluctant blessing. In all, 24 members of the Tampa's normal complement of 70 officers and men hailed from Tampa. Tampa was assigned as an ocean escort to Squadron 1 of the patrol forces, commanded by Rear Admiral Albert P. Niblack. Writer Alexander Lazarly, a Coast Guard veteran, described the Tampa service in his 2003 book, The Coast Guard in World War I, An Untold Story. She was assigned ocean escort duty, protecting convoys from German submarines on the route between Gibraltar and the southern coast of England. On the average, she spent more than half of her time at sea and steamed more than 3,500 nautical miles, or 6,500 kilometers, per month. Between 27 October 1917 and 31 July 1918, she escorted 18 convoys between Gibraltar and Great Britain, losing only two ships out of all those escorted. Leslie notes that the Tampa brought her guns into action several times, but did not have a verifiable run-in with a U-boat. Wambolt Sumner wrote his family, We see lots of sailors and soldiers from the States, and we have to tell them about all the subs, whether we have seen them or not. And in another letter, we're out looking for Fritz's. Hope we get one. The duty was certainly not without risk. The history of the ship described in the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command notes that on May 21st, there was a premature detonation from gum number two, resulting in a mortal wound to one of the ship's coxswains, who died of his wounds the following day. When the cutter reached Devonport on 25 May, the body was landed and prepared for burial. This death prompted the assignment of a Navy surgeon to the ship's complement. Despite the wartime conditions, the crew sought to reassure their family. L.G. Bevins wrote in a letter, both well, etc., and going about our duties without any fears. And it strikes me that if we can see nothing to be afraid of, why, you all should have no great cause to worry. The danger is no more here than in any other industry back home, so just put those petty fears aside and look at the bright side, always. In fact, the crew had other concerns. The Tampa Bay Times notes that Algy complained that his family wasn't writing him enough, and in September, Wambolt Sumner sent his family the happy news that he had presented his fiancée a five-diamond ring and planned to marry her when he returned. 
The Tampa earned a stellar reputation for her service. In her 11 months service, the ship had been at sea more than half the time and was known as one of the most efficient of the ocean escort force. On September 15th, Rear Admiral Niblack offered a commendation for that service. This excellent record is evidence of a high state of efficiency, an excellent ship spirit, and an organization capable of keeping the vessel in service with minimum shore assistance. The squadron commander takes great pleasure in congratulating the commanding officer, officers and crew of the record that they have made. Two days later, on September 17, 1918, Tampa, in company with her fellow escorts, departed Gibraltar with the 32-ship convoy HG-107, bound for Liverpool. Robert Johnson, a professor of history at the University of Alabama, described the actions of the Tampa as the convoy approached its destination in his 1983 book Guardians of the Sea, History of the United States Coast Guard. As the convoy stood in the Bristol Channel during the evening of 26 September, Captain Charles Satterley received the customary order to take the cutter to Milford Haven. Sometimes later, at about 8.45, the shock of an explosion was felt by several in the convoy. It seems not to have been important enough for the British destroyers to investigate, but when the Tampa failed to arrive at Milford Haven, escort vessels based there undertook a search. Three days cruising along the cutter's probable track resulted in the recovery of two unidentified bodies and some floating wreckage. The fate of the Tampa only became known after the war, when the records of the German submarine UB-91 were recovered. The Tampa Bay Times summarizes the encounter. As dusk was setting in over the Irish Sea, a German submarine spotted a lone ship steaming towards England's Bristol Channel. The U-boat dived to attack. About half an hour later, it fired a single torpedo. In his battle notes, the commander, Captain Lieutenant Wolf Hans Hartwig, described the explosion. A black cloud of smoke and a second explosion may be the depth charges aboard the ship. Then, Hertwig wrote, not to be seen anymore. Within 15 minutes, he had the submarine surface to search for survivors, bodies, or wreckage. Nothing found, he wrote. The Naval History and Heritage Command notes, all on board the cutter, 111 Coast Guard officers and men, four Navy sailors, and 14 British passengers were lost. The Coast Guard historian's officer says of the loss of the Tampa, the sinking of the cutter was the single largest loss of life for the Coast Guard during World War I. The sacrifices of her crew were not forgotten. The city of Tampa conducted a fundraising campaign, Remember the Tampa, in an effort to sell war bonds. In 1921, the Coast Guard christened a new cutter in her name. Seven years later, on 23 May 1928, the U.S. Coast Guard Memorial was dedicated at Arlington National Cemetery, honoring the sacrifice of those who had served aboard Tampa. The Punta Gorda Herald of Punta Gorda, Florida wrote at the time, Thus are the horrors of war brought home to us all, and Tampa and the friends and relatives of the dead have the sympathy of us all. The loss of Tampa and her crew was perhaps all the more tragic because of the timing. The Tampa was sunk less than six weeks before the end of the war. It is difficult to contextualize the loss of these 129 souls in the context of a war in which some 20 million people died, but the loss of the Tampa illustrates the horrors of that war. An April 2019 article in Stars and Stripes magazine tells the story of Anna Bonaparte, who was four years old when her father James Wilkie died on board the USS Tampa. Though she didn't have many memories of her father, she constantly spoke about him and his service in the Coast Guard, said her son, Wallace Bonaparte. A January 2001 edition of the St. Petersburg Times quoted Edwin T. Galvin, whose father and uncle served on the ship. Galvin says that his father transferred off a month before it sank and never got over the guilt. The ship left port here with his brother and his two best friends, Galvin said. He never saw them again. He talked about it through his tears many times. The Tampa Bay Times quoted Rodney Kite Powell, curator of the Tampa History Center. So many young men. 24 from the area lost their lives in the blink of an eye. That was just devastating. Wayne Bolt Sumner's fiance sent the five diamond ring that he had given her to his family. The Tampa Bay Times reports that it is now in the possession of his niece, given to her by her mother. The family never learned anything more about the betrothed, just that her first name was Jessie. All we know is her first name, said the niece. Her identity and how she decided she wanted my mother to have the ring, we will never know. In 1999, at the recommendation of retired Master Chief Petty Officer James C. Bunch, the Coast Guard began an ongoing project to identify family of the Coast Guardsmen killed aboard the Tampa and give them 
Purple Hearts. Stars and Stripes magazine explains that the Purple Heart wasn't authorized for the Coast Guard until 1942, and it wasn't until a decade later, in 1952, that it became possible to award it retroactively to 1917, and apparently the Coast Guardsmen lost aboard the Tampa were overlooked at the time. In 1919, five Coast Guard patrol craft were named in the honor of the officers of the Tampa, and two U.S. destroyers have been named after Captain Charles Satterley. The name Tampa continues with the Coast Guard, most recently with the 270-foot Medium Endurance Class Cutter in service since 1984. The Hillsborough County webpage concludes, says the Coast Guard, few words carry as much weight in the annals of the history of the Coast Guard as the word Tampa. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.